Welcome to today's ICENTD Connect meeting. Uh, it's lovely to see many of you connecting from around the world and uh, from uh, the ICENTD here in London. A very big and warm hello. Uh, we're really thrilled today. We're hosting our fourth webinar um, within ICENTD Connect uh, as part of the Global Schistosomiasis Alliance series. And today we will be taking a closer look at the control and elimination of schistosomiasis in Cameroon. Uh, we're truly delighted to host this session uh, at the time of the, the publication of the very recent progress report that summarizes key achievements towards elimination of schistosomiasis and soil transmitted helminths in Cameroon and uh, that over the time period of 2003 to 2019. And it is absolutely our pleasure today to welcome Professor Louis-Albert Chuemchuente. Uh, Professor Chuemchuente is currently full professor of parasitology at the University of Yaoundé One, and is also uh, NTD advocate and ambassador with a huge amount of experience. Uh, professor Chuemchuente, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. Yeah, good afternoon, Marianne. Uh, it's a pleasure to present at this webinar. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful and an honor to um, have you as part of this webinar. I should probably take a few seconds to explain to our attendees that uh, the system, uh, when based on the amount of available bandwidth, tends to have a mind of its own and switches participants' cameras on and off. So case wondering why Professor is appearing and disappearing, <laughs> that would be the reason. Uh, but Professor is with us and is about to give us a comprehensive overview of the huge amount of progress and partnerships that have enabled um, uh, a, a tremendous amount of work in the control and elimination of schistosomiasis in Cameroon. It's going to be very uh, difficult to um, introduce Professor Chuen Chuente and summarize uh, your many achievements within a few um, minutes or seconds. Um, I probably would start off by saying that, uh, Professor, you've got um, over 35 years of extensive experience, not just in schistosomiasis, but also uh, several other neglected tropical diseases, and this spans program development, uh, management implementation, but also resource mobilization, partnership development, capacity building. So all of the hugely important steps uh, when one is building uh, these national programs. And during the time, your time at the University of Yaoundé, but also within uh, WHO uh, and also other positions, you've also founded and are currently the director of the Center for Schistosomiasis and Parasitology, which is the reference center uh, for schisto and soil transmitted helminths in Cameroon. And you're also the coordinator of the national program for the control of schisto and intestinal helminthiasis in Cameroon. Many other projects came under your umbrella, which uh, uh, you were funded and supported by whether it be WHO, the EU, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and uh, more recently, you are so you are also um, a major partner in the UK AIDS supported countdown project on NTDs. So really, a huge amount of partnerships there, and I am sure there are many people on this webinar who have uh, worked with you and know you very closely. Um, so. My introduction uh, could go on for a lot longer, but I think uh, at this point I will hand over to you, uh, Professor Tran Chuente, and to take us through um, some of the achievements and uh, of the programs you've run and the situation for Shisto um, in Cameroon at the moment. So from all of us, a very big thank you. I'll hand over in a couple seconds. And uh, before I do so, just to remind all our attendees that uh, please feel free to say hello on our chat function, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, it tell us where you're tuning in from. And also, if you have any comments or questions for Professor, uh, please don't hesitate to post those. And we will have a, a nice discussion at the end of uh, this presentation. Uh, so until then, I'm going to disappear. And Professor, thanks again for, for your time and for joining us today. 
Okay, thanks Marianne for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, I will also start by saying a great thank to organizing this uh, webinar together with uh, GSA. So um, my greeting also to all uh, participants to this webinar. So this webinar provides an opportunity at this peculiar COVID-19 period to share with you all the progress in the control of schizomiasis in Cameroon and the way forward for the elimination of this disease. Uh, I will just start by presenting briefly uh, the situation of schizomiasis in Cameroon. So Cameroon, as uh, you know, is situated in Central Africa. Uh, we have a total population of uh, about 26 million and the uh, annual growth rate is 2.6%. Uh, in terms of the administration, we have 10 regions uh, and the country also subdivide in 190 health districts. Uh, among the health districts, 19 are uh, endemic for schizomiasis uh, deserve uh, mass drug administration. Uh, in Cameroon, the highest endemicity of schizomiasis uh, occur in the northern, in the three northern regions. And uh, it is estimated this estimation was based on the first national survey that was conducted in the 1985 that more than 2 million people are infected and over 5 million are at risk of infection. And we have the occurrence of three species of schistosomias. Uh, this is Hematobium, Mansoni, and Guinensis. And several species of uh, snail are involved in this transmission. Uh, we have seven species that are intermediate host. Uh, these are four bilinous species for uh, hematobium, one bilinous species for guineensis, and two bonfalaria species for mansoni. So this shows the diversity of the transmission and uh, also uh, contribute to various transmission dynamics, including single and mixed species infection. Uh, this picture uh, this figure shows the distribution of the three species that occur in Cameroon. Uh, in blue, we have Schizoma hematobium. In red, we have Schizoma mansoni. Uh, in yellow, Guineensis. So from this, you can realize that we have a significant uh, area where we have uh, interaction between uh, Schizoma species. And this also led to severe uh, interaction, competition, and also hybridization between guineensis and hematobium. Uh, based on the fact that uh, schistosomiasis was seen as a real public health problem in Cameroon, in 2003, the government response was to create the national control program to tackle the disease and then to reduce the burden on infection and also to move toward elimination. So, in terms of uh, the organization of the program, uh, we have uh, at the National Steering Committee, the chair of this committee is the Minister, Minister of Public Health, and the vice chair is the Minister of Basic Education. So this is to highlight the high level government commitment to this program. And the main control strategy focus around systematic dewarming of school health children and group at risk. Uh, this is done in collaboration with the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education, and also with uh, the collaboration of all partners that are involved in this uh, program. Uh, then I will present briefly some of the main achievements that uh, were done between 2003 and 2019, 2019. Uh, since then, since the creation of the program, considerable progress has been made in the fight of schistosomiasis. Uh, the key achievements are summarized in the 2003-2019 progress report. So this report has been produced recently and has been shared widely. So if uh, people want more detail, this uh, report is online and can be downloaded on the link uh, that I present here. So from here, you can have the full report and have uh, the detail of what I've achieved in Cameroon since the creation of the program. 
I will just focus on some of the main area where uh, significant progress was made. The first one is the production of strategic document. So because this is very important to have the document that guide the implementation of the program and also orient uh, the strategy to move forward and also to coordinate all the activity with the different partners that are involved in this. So the second area uh, is uh, the strengthening of partnership and collaboration, because this is very important. We cannot achieve this uh, huge challenge without a good partnership and also a strong uh, collaboration between and um, uh, coordination between all partners. Uh, I will just highlight two main aspects of this. The first is the partnership between the government and the council. So in 2009, uh, the Minister of Health, together with the Ministry of Basic Education, signed a partnership agreement with the Union of Council and City of Cameroon to fight against Shizumiazi and STH. So this was a very good step forward because they involved the municipality in the control of this program. Uh, also, is a good link to mobilize all the community to this program. Uh, in 2012, uh, this uh, partnership will extend to the Ministry of Secondary Education. The reason of doing that is that many school age children between, uh, from 10 years above are not in the primary school anymore. That is why we include the first four years of the secondary school in the partnership. And then every year we have a, a control and uh, dewarming of all uh, children in the primary school in the first fair year. The other second point of this uh, partnership is the high level engagement of the government and partner. And uh, this is just to illustrate an example of uh, the um, high level uh, commitment by the prime minister. When we have the visit of uh, the chairman of the MEC board in director of in Cameroon in 2014, uh, there was a meeting with the Prime Minister, uh, also with different other minister, ministers. So this also is very important to uh, have the high level government commitment to this uh, program. Uh, the third one that we focus on is the treatment delivery and training. Uh, this graph shows that we start the program, the first dewarming, uh, in 2006, and this was conducted only in one of the 10 regions of Cameroon, uh, a total of 170,000 children were treated. But since then, there, there were a steady increase of the number of children treated in Cameroon to reach uh, more than 7 million in 2019. Uh, when you consider all the treatment that were provided in Cameroon for Shisto, we have a cumulative 25, more than 25 million treatment delivered against Shizumiazi in Cameroon. Uh, before doing the development, it's very important to train. Uh, we have two major components of training. Uh, more than one, 100,000 teacher and health worker are trained every year, and they are dedicated to support the development of school aid children either in school and also in the community. Uh, the second component of training was also to train the journalists for the communication, because we realized that uh, many of, most of the time, uh, many journalists, when they report on the NTD and other disease, they don't have the background to report properly. So it was very important to have this pool of journalists on the field. So then you have the, these journalists in the canoe that have to go to the hotspot and also to know the reality of the transmission of the disease so that they are aware of what is happening in the field, what are the problems in the community, they can discuss with this community, and then when they uh, report on it, it is more accurate. So that was a very good achievement to have the journalists on board and then to be trained to report on this disease. The first component is the complementary public health intervention. So with the support of a uh, partner, uh, other uh, agent, we also develop uh, some wash activities. Uh, the main was uh, the provision of safe drinking water through construction of borehole and also the creation of wash club in school. So this was uh, in the area where we have the sport with uh, a good neighbor. 
So that was quite interesting. And then we also have the promotion of social behavior change communication and wash in the other region. Uh, this is with the support of site server. So this complementary intervention also allow to compare uh, also where we only have the warming activity and the area where we have the warming plus uh, other public intervention to uh, also measure the difference between the impact. Uh, the fifth area is the research aspect, because uh, as uh, we are also involved in several operational research with several partner uh, base uh, either in Cameroon and Europe, uh, in America, etc. So we have a strong research component that allow us to also measure the program impact. Uh, in the impact study, for example, I will just highlight uh, one case in one region of the center. This is the map on the left of uh, the distribution of Shizuzumia, this is where it was mapped in 85. Uh, this is the map uh, on the, in the middle of the recent survey that we conduct in 2018. So we realized that based on this, you can see that the number of green area is increasing compared to what we had before. Uh, when we analyze the data at the overall national level, we notice that we have an overall 70% 70, 70 reduction of schizophrenia prevalence in Cameroon between uh, 1985 and 2018. The second component of uh, key uh, research achievement was uh, in the mapping, mapping updates. Uh, we were also able to uh, erase and develop a novel mapping approach. This is uh, around the precision mapping, uh, which become uh, as an innovative tool and way forward to string the map and then to better target intervention and to accelerate toward the elimination of schizomiasis. Uh, the brief uh, definition we gave to precision mapping in this paper that was published uh, in PLOS uh, is that precision mapping is defined as conducting sampling at the much final geographic resolution, potentially examining all school within every subunit in each implementation unit in order to eliminate the error caused by missing the focal variation of schizomiasis prevalence. Uh, this is the ideal case, but uh, we know that it's a lot of resources, so we cannot sample all school, but the minimum is to sample at least some school in each sub-district so that we have the accurate distribution of the disease, taking into account the high focality. Uh, the sixth aspect was the meeting and conferences. Uh, I will just highlight two types of conference and meeting we had. It, the first one is the evaluation and validation meetings. So at the end of each uh, campaign, we have an evaluation meeting. Uh, we see that this meeting is uh, usually chaired by the Minister of Health and the Minister of Basic Education and all partners are involved. So at this meeting, we present uh, the achievement. Also, we strongly discuss the problem that we encountered during the program and the way to optimize our intervention and to uh, improve our strategy. So this uh, evaluation meeting are also very important. And when there's also some decision to be taken for some tool, this tool also have to validate at the end by during these meetings. The second type of meeting uh, is what the statutory meetings. This is mainly the meetings of the National Steering Committee. So this is held once a year uh, this is uh, the high level where uh, decisions are taken and also the orientation are given to the, the way forward and uh, also what should be done uh, to move, to eliminate uh, also to have the good achievement in this program. Uh, this meeting is always presided by the Minister of Health together with the Minister of Basic Education. Uh, we have the participation of uh, all key partners, including WHO, uh, all other NGO that support the program and uh, its activities. Uh, the second important meeting that we had was the international conference. Uh, in 2017, based uh, 
on the result and data that we gather in the country, it was important to have this international meeting with all international experts to discuss the result of, and then this meeting was uh, entitled Towards Elimination of Schizomiasis. And it was very important uh, to also develop what is the way forward, what are the key strategy uh, you want to have this paradigm sh shift. Uh, this last slide for this first part of the presentation summarizes all key achievements and milestones between 2003 2019. I will not go uh, in detail in all these at different achievements because you have all these details in the progress report. So you can just go to it and have more information about it. So what I will just highlight is some uh, fact that uh, the program uh, was launched in 2004. We have the first donation of Razicantel by Merck uh, through WHO to Cameroon in 2008. Uh, since then, there have been a significant increase. You can see the increase of the warming. Uh, this graph also includes the warming for STH uh, because we co-implement the two diseases together. Uh, for STH, for example, we start with 170,000 in 2006. Uh, we reach more than 10 million children treated in Cameroon in 2019. Uh, this also show the achievement in terms of mapping. We have a mapping update at different period 2010, 2011, and 2012, where mapping was update uh, in Cameroon, in the, et cetera. So this, based on all this achievement, uh, it was very important to have uh, a way forward in the country. That is why, uh, 2017 was one of the crucial period where we faced several challenge. Uh, one of the big challenge that we faced in 2017 was uh, when the USID withdrew its funding for schizomiasis control in the country. Uh, because so far, as you can see uh, in this picture, uh, the first one, uh, we have uh, the funding of USID uh, from 2010 to 2017. Uh, then when the, this fund was stopped, uh, it was very important to have, uh, to take a decision in the country. That is why we have uh, one of the extraordinary string committee meeting in 2017. And the community, uh, the committee examined all the prospect, et cetera, on the station, uh, came out with a clear uh, recommendation uh, to the program. The first, the committee reaffirmed the country commitment to move from control to elimination of schizomiasis. Uh, the committee used to continue the deworming in school because uh, the committee thought that if we interrupt the transmission is uh, the deworming in school, this will be very detrimental. Uh, then the committee put a very strong uh, recommendation which is a big challenge to mobilize national and international financing in order to sustain activities for elimination. Uh, that is where uh, the report on the test conference also provides some of the very good insight and the way forward. Because when one of the outcome of this test conference in 2017 uh, is that was that uh, to move to elimination, the key, there are some key intervention that should be implemented. Uh, we re re select four of these intervention. The first was to expand the general access to price content treatment to all population and to increase the availability of medicine in health center and treatment station throughout the year. Because what happened that in many countries is that after, between the two deworming campaign, the uh, medicine is not available to treat people that need it. So it's very important that uh, in the future we have a treatment price counter available uh, throughout the year. The second recommendation was to complete the precision mapping. And the third one to intensify multi-sectoral action uh, because we also need to have all these complementary intervention, wash, uh, etc. 
are then to encourage community ownership in the program. Uh, this is uh, what the different steps recommended by WHO when you want to move toward elimination. After a round of preventive chemotherapy, and when you have achieved uh, morbidity control and very low uh, prevalence of high infection, then you have to adjust and intensify your preventive chemotherapy and uh, add to this complementary measure. This includes access to clean water, improved sanitation, hygiene, education, and snail control, etc. So this is the first challenge that we have to move from uh, MDA-focused intervention to integrate and intensify intervention. The second challenge uh, is to extend treatment to all population in need. Uh, this includes children below five years. Uh, that is where uh, there is a new gen need to have the prazicantel, the pediatric formulation of prazicantel to have to allow the deworming of this group of children uh, to reach out of school children, and then also to reach the adults. Another uh, challenge is to adapt treatment strategy to local transmission setting. As I mentioned in the previous slide, we have high diversity of transmission dynamic, and in some area we have rapid reinfection. And in this area, you cannot have the same treatment regime as uh, in area where you have low reinfection rate. That is why in some of the high transmission setting, that some of the hotspots, we introduce treatment twice per year. And it was very beneficial to reduce the uh, prevalence and then to sustain it for some time. Uh, there is also a major threat of resurgence when you have the discontinuation of treatment. And other challenge uh, just list here, I will not uh, spend a lot of time on this. Uh, there is also, I'll just highlight a few of them. Uh, the one is uh, towards diagnostic tool, because in some area when you have low prevalence, it's good to have a, a diagnostic tool, so that more sensitive tool. The second one is uh, snail control. Uh, also, the last one is to change the strategy. Uh, and also, the treatment threshold to, have to be adapted to our elimination. Uh, then one of the major challenges also the funding, because uh, you want to move to elimination, there is a need to have more funding. And that is why, based on all this analysis, uh, we work on the new roadmap toward 2020, 2030. Uh, this roadmap, I will just start by highlight uh, the NTD roadmap that is developed, that was developed by WHO and partner. Uh, this roadmap has several pillar, three pillar, and the third one uh, emphasizes on country ownership. So, what does it mean, as we interpret in Cameroon, is that the country ownership starts by a clear vision and the identification of critical action to be implemented, and that is why we are developing this roadmap. Uh, then, this roadmap is entitled "To Elimination of Schistosomiasis in Cameroon." a roadmap for paradigm shift 2021-2030. It is quite ambitious, uh, but uh, it is necessary uh, you want to move toward this elimination. And we have identified programmatic action, seven of them. The first one is the complete depression mapping. The second is to expand access to treatment. And then the third one is strength health system operational capacity. Uh, the fourth, intensify multi-sectorial action. The fifth one is around the monitoring and evaluation. And the sixth one, advocacy and funding. And then the last one is to encourage country and community ownership of the program. I will just give some few words about the different one. And then the first one, precision mapping. Precision mapping should be used to generate the best evidence-based data to guide intensify intervention in target transmission zone. Uh, this will also allow to shrink the map and to and for better and rational utilization of price content. And then the first question is, why should we complete precision mapping? Uh, because now we assume that the mapping is done and is completed for Shisto in almost all countries in the region. Uh, the reason of moving to a policy mapping 
The first reason is that we have complex results and lack of data for the majority of sub-districts. Uh, if when we analyze all the data, just this is just a case of few examples. Here we have uh, six different health districts. Uh, this health, this figure is based on the mapping that was conducted in 2010. Uh, we noticed that uh, only sub area of uh, this district were maps. All the green mean that there is no there was there is no data. And then, based on that, we notice that from uh, the first one where it's the green, the first sample shows that there is no transmission. And then to the highest level in the right, where we have the heavy infection above uh, 50%, in the between, you have uh, a mixture of low and high. Uh, then, when we have this uh, impact, eval impact study in 2018 in this health district, we have complete different uh, figures. Uh, this figure was completely impossible to predict from the mapping we have in 2010. So the, where we have uh, the first one in the left, where the first the mapping in 2010 showed that uh, it was completely green. So this means no transmission. Uh, the mapping in 2010 showed that there are some high, high transmission sub area that were not mapped before. And uh, we have this uh, everywhere in this. Uh, so this is the f one figure that shows that with this uh, complex result uh, and the lack of data in most of the sub-district, it is important to conduct mapping in this uh, area where we don't have uh, data in the sub at the sub-district level. The second point is uh, the difficult to assess and evaluate the impact in the future without sub-district update data. Because if you focus on what we have now, if we don't have data in the sub-district, how can we, will we be able to validate for 2029 the impact uh, in the sub-district where there was no data previously? Uh, this is another clear example. That is in, 2000, in, 19, no, in 1985, we have two health districts. The one above, we just sampled two, sub, two sub-districts, and then the one Below, we sample also one sub-district, but uh, several schools. But we have this uh, um, distribution of the disease, this endemicity level. This is, uh, and then in 2010, for the same district, uh, this, this we sample more, but not the entire district, and we have this result. But in 2018, where we did a slight a light precision mapping something at least one school in each sub district we have this figure so the first district above show that the focus of transmission is in only one health district uh, uh, from the uh, 19 district sub district of this district so is this uh, area where you have uh, this uh, dark red then we have to focus our intervention there and then the map below to show that in 2018 we have a new area that we're not sampled before, which is the area where we have the major problem. So we completely read. So this highlights the fact that uh, it is difficult to assess if we don't have the, the data, what we call the baseline data by sub-district. And then, and then based on this, what is the current mapping gaps? Uh, we analyze all the data we have in the country the country has uh, 190 health districts, uh, have uh, 1,798 sub-districts, what we call in common health area. In 85, only 353 health area were sampled, have a data, at least one school sample, they represent 20%. In 2010, uh, 507, uh, in 2018, 300. But when the data analysis showed that uh, 971 health district, uh, no, health area have never been sampled in, in the country. So this represents 54% of sub district never sampled. So then when we take into consideration the fact that uh, it is recommended by WHO uh, globally that we have to update the data regularly uh, up to five years. 
And then therefore we realized that uh, all data, all health area that was mapped in 2010 and nothing uh, in 2018, the data there need to be updated. And then the declare need to be mapped, to be remapped. So this gave us a total of 1,487 uh, health, uh, health area to be remapped. Uh, using Christian mapping. This represents 83%. So in the control of mobility setting, this is not necessary. But in the target of elimination, this is necessary because uh, considering the high focality of the disease transmission, it is important to know the strength of each health area so that we can move forward and assess the impact later. Uh, this is clearly illustrated in this map. In this map, we can show that the green in 2018 is the majority. So green means that there is no data. Uh, then we also developed an atlas. Uh, the atlas was developed uh, to provide and also uh, more detail on the distribution of and the landscape of schisto distribution and evolution at the lowest level in the country. Uh, this guide assists also the Ministry of Health and decision maker and stakeholder involved in the fight against zoomiasis. This is also uh, complementary to SPEN, but moving forward uh, toward the lowest level, uh, then the future is also to go to have the data and the information capture at the level of the, at the village level. Uh, this also is an important decision tool that reinforce country ownership uh, there is a link for this atlas. Uh, the atlas, uh, we have the website where the data can be, the map can be seen. Uh, also, we have all this detailed information. So this is the website. Uh, I will not navigate through the website because any of you can go to the website. But we have the data of all health area and uh, have the progress from uh, 85 till now. So uh, this will be updated regularly so that at any time, uh, each, people, each person at the district level will be able to know exactly the decision of his own district and then the decision on what to do, uh, the way to move forward. Uh, to reach uh, the to, to reach the elimination is, is important to expand access of treatment. Uh, this will include preschool children, school children and adults. This picture shows that uh, all age groups are exposed and infected by schizomiasis. Uh, here, in this water contact, we have preschool age children, school age children, and adults are all in contact and they are all infected. And the study we did in one of these areas show that the preschool age children, uh, we have infection prevalence up to 57% in preschool age children, and in adults, 65%, and uh, in school age children, 79%. Uh, the good news is that when you treat, uh, the follow-up survey show that we have a significant drop of prevalence after as to the level of 11%, 3%, and 16% respectively. So it is important to treat all the age group if you want to reduce uh, the transmission in all setting. Uh, the expand the to expand treatment also. We also have to adapt the treatment to transmission dynamic. I already mentioned that in some area, there is a need to treat twice, tw twice a year. Uh, also, we have to redefine disease endemicity and eligibility to MDR as we decrease the prevalence. This is also uh, be readjust uh, when WHO will uh, uh, publish uh, the new guideline that is currently uh, under development. And then the third one is strengthening health system capacity. Uh, I will just focus on two aspects, data collection through DHES2. This is a district health, system, uh, health information system. This is a platform that is used by the Ministry of Health. It's a web base to integrate all data for all the different program on health activity. So we have to integrate the collection of uh, the, the warming, et cetera, uh, in this. And uh, we also have to train uh, to build the cap uh, lab capacity of the laboratory at the health district level so that uh, at th they can do uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, at that level without having to rely on the national level for this. 
Uh, the third, the fourth one is to intensify multi-sectoral action. Uh, we have the wash intervention and also the snail control. Uh, the fifth one is monitoring and evaluation. That is where we have the diagnostic tool, uh, also the atlas that need to be updated regularly. Uh, we also have to develop uh, also strengthening research and innovation. Uh, we will be appropriate to find appropriate solution again she summarizes throughout the program. Uh, the sixth one is advocacy and funding. Uh, that is very important. We have to advocate to for adequate financial resources. Uh, it's also important to adequate to increase access to medicine because, as I mentioned, you want to move to elimination. There is a need to have more drugs compared to what we are doing now. Only the one for uh, mobility control. Uh, then we also finally have to encourage country ownership. Uh, to encourage country ownership, we have to develop comprehensive national policy on systematic elimination with key complementary intervention that need to be implemented. Uh, we also have to advocate for improved water and sanitation with a link to water development project. So this uh, is very important. Uh, at this final slide for this, I will just highlight some of the indicators that will be measured throughout the roadmap. Uh, for the expense of treatment is moved from treatment coverage, percentage of reduction in people requiring intervention against tumazis, to the last one, to the number of health districts taking ownership of schizomiasis control and elimination. Uh, at the end, there is a need for some dramatic change. If you don't change the transmission factors, uh, we cannot move away because you just treat, we don't change all this environment, uh, then the disease will still be there. So this is the one of the biggest challenges to change all this environment uh, so that uh, we can improve, uh, reduce the parasite transmission uh, in the field. Uh, the last picture I would want to show is, is the need to invest in infrastructure uh, to eliminate schisto. Uh, this is part of the third report that was published by WHO. Uh, the figure uh, in the right is one of the examples of the previous high transmission of schistomiasis in China, in the Jiangsu. And uh, since they build all this dam and transform all this area, there is no snail there and there is no transmission anymore. So the investment in the infrastructure is a big challenge that Africa has to face. We want to move toward elimination. Uh, the, I will end by uh, acknowledgement to the key partner that support our program. I will start by this uh, partner that will provide support for mass drug administration. This is for the national control, uh, the warming program campaign between 2006 and 2019. So we start with a UNICEF waffle program uh, between the 2017 and 2008. It was only national funding because there was no support from external. So on nine, we have the support from Global Network for NTD for one year. And then we have the, we are lucky to have the USID on board from 2010 to 2017. So in 2018, when USD stopped the funding, we only conduct uh, the, the warming in only in few health districts uh, and then uh, without external resources. And then we use this period also to advocate and to mobilize additional funding. That is why in 2019, we were very lucky to have uh, several partners on board. So we have uh, size silver with, this, with funding from GiveWell that are currently support, in 2019, support five regions of Cameroon. Uh, we have COICA with the, uh, through the Good Neighbor NGO that is provide support for one uh, region of the country. Uh, we also have WHO Spain that support one region in 2019. Uh, we have three regions that will not conduct the warming, the northwest and the southwest. This was not done because of the security region in those areas. And the southwest uh, and the south there is not endemic for, mass, for MDA for schistosomiasis. So this show the uh, partner contribution. And this last one show all the partner that support schisto and STH control in Cameroon. So uh, I will also take this opportunity to thank all these partners. Uh, 
at all levels, from the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Secondary Education, and all the council, uh, also the other international partner, bilateral, etc., WHO, UNICEF. I cannot list everybody, but they are here mentioned. So this is what has been done in Cameroon. Uh, I thank you very much for all your attention. Uh, so that will give some few time for some question. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for listening. Well, a massive thank you, Professor Chuan Chuente, from us all, uh, tuning in from around the world. Uh, this is just a tremendous amount of work and achievements um, for schistosomiasis control. Lots of lessons for this community, but also pretty much for any disease control community. I think you've managed to cover all of it um, within the programs from the precision mapping uh, all the way to the treatment aspect, um, expanding access, but also strengthening health systems themselves, and then all the way to boosting advocacy, um, bringing in funding, uh, boosting multi-sectoral collaboration, and even bringing media on board and really thinking in a very 360 way about disease control. This is uh, incredible and um, lots of food for thought there. So thank you so much. Um, you are right. Uh, lots of questions uh, coming in on our chat for you, Professor. Um, first of all, many, many thank yous from our attendees, uh, Chris. Isabel Matthews, very much Professor Ilya Dow, thank you for the great presentation. Anne Wogu, thank you Professor, excellent pre presentation, sorry, and many, many more. Um, we actually have a, a huge amount of countries and nationalities represented here, Professor, who tuned in to hear from you. Uh, just a very warm hello to um, our attendees, of course, from Cameroon. Lots of people tuning in. Hello, uh, Justin Komgwepnono, Kemgo Nongli, and Hermine Jatsa, Robert Shea. Hello and welcome to the webinar. Um, we've also had uh, Mariana Dallastella from Brazil. Hello. And Cesar Gavidia, who's wishing us good morning from Lima in Peru, uh, as well as uh, Cosmas Delejong from Calgary, Canada. So a, a truly international audience, Professor, and uh, right here in the UK, uh, Professor Russell Stottard from LSTM, uh, Bonnie Webster, David Rollinson from the NHM, uh, and many, many more. So a huge hello to everyone. I wish I could um, say hi to everyone, list everyone. I've already had a few private comments about how nice it is to see the whole Shisto community uh, reunited here and brought together by a professor's presentation. So uh, certainly a, a great audience and lots of people thanking you. Um, so, so without, any, without any further ado, Professor, perhaps we can start with uh, some of the questions that have come in for you. Uh, maybe just starting off uh, having a look at uh, questions around prevalence. Uh, so some of these or part of these questions may already have been answered in part throughout the presentation and certainly uh, uh, we would recommend having a look as well at the atlas which you outlined. And uh, I'll take this opportunity to also thank Anuk Guvras from the uh, GSA for always posting out uh, the links, the right link at the right time. So that's tremendous help. So massive thanks and hello, Anuk, for that. Uh, so definitely please consult the Atlas. And here are a couple questions for you, Professor. So um, first of all, from Kemgo Francis Nogoli from Cameroon, who's asking, uh, which region in Cameroon has the highest prevalence of schisto? And building on that, uh, Boney Webster from the National, National Natural History Museum here in London asking, is the prevalence data broken down by the three species? And has there been a better response by certain species, intestinal or urogenital? And also, is schistosoma grinensis still transmitted? So a couple of questions there around prevalence for you, Professor. Okay, thank you, Mariam. And uh, thank also to all uh, attendees for all these different interests and questions. So regarding the first one, the region that we have the highest prevalence in the far north of the country, where we have a high level of transmission there. And then the second one is the north of the country, North Cameroon. And uh, then for Guinnessis, we still have a transmission of Guinnessis uh, in about five 
uh, area, uh, five uh, I would call village, uh, where we have continuous guineanses. In other parts, uh, only few cases that are described, but where we have active transmission is only around five. Yes. Muted myself. Thank you, fantastic yes. professor. Um, let's talk about snails now. Uh, Stephen Bremer was asking, uh, in your mapping program, do you consider the seasonality of the seven intermediate snail species? Do all the seven snail species occur together, i.e. at the same time? Uh, this is also expanded on by, in a question by Ilian Dams, who's asking, uh, saying, highlighting that the pragmatic steps you want to undertake don't include the snail vectors. Is this an omission or is this a reason for this? Um, and Reid Osretic was asking, could you offer further details on the methods of snail control you would see to be most effective and why that method is best? Okay, thanks for this question. So regarding the snail, that is a very huge component that uh, we intend to develop further. Uh, currently, uh, the main transmission sites of Cameroon uh, are permanent. So this, this snail are distributed, uh, are found permanently. Although we have some uh, variation in dynamics uh, of the population, uh, but most of the transmission sites are permanent transmission sites. So uh, we have not taken into consideration this seasonality for the mapping, but the consider most was, consideration was most focused on the uh, infection and the period where you have in ad infection in children, or also the treatment period, because uh, the major constraint is that when you have uh, uh, MDA ongoing in the country, there is some constraint that you cannot do the uh, survey uh, very close to this. It, the minimum is six months, so this is also another constraint so that we have to take into consideration. Uh, then. Uh, for the snail component and the control, uh, what the first uh, area of intervention will be using the multisiding to for this snail. Uh, we will start with the pilot because we have an ongoing uh, pilot area uh, in uh, one district, and uh, we start from then. This is with the support from the good neighbors. Uh, then we will build on also with the collaboration with uh, the Chinese. Uh, because we also have a strong uh, partnership agreement with China, so that we use this opportunity to develop uh, what are the most appropriate uh, snail control uh, method, uh, using also the recent guideline for snail control that was produced by WHO. Thank you, Professor, for that. Um, uh, just thinking now about uh, the community, so we've got an excellent question here from Juliet Chami from the University of Oxford who's asking, uh, are the schools closed at the moment? And if so, uh, or when they were closed, if they have now reopened, uh, what is or was the current implementation strategy? Was it entirely community-based or was it relying on finding school children in the communities? So regarding this period with the COVID, since uh, March, all the schools in Cameroon were closed. And then the first consequence, based also on some of the WHO recommendation, also in country recommendation, was to stop or to postpone all community intervention. So school-based, the warming was stopped, uh, community distribution, etc. all this was stopped. And then uh, the school resumed sometime in June for some exam, and now it's closed. So now uh, uh, we are now waiting for the when the school will resume in October, uh, hoping that the COVID uh, will allow to resume the activity in the communities uh, so that we'll have the dewarming. Uh, so the warming has been stopped, uh, postponed to October. But recently we have uh, some case where we have uh, uh, some emergency and urgent case where we have to deworm. This is in the West region, in one of the districts where we have high transmission. Because in this area, as I mentioned, we have to deworm every six months. Uh, because we didn't want, when we did not de uh, deworm at, in March, uh, recently there was some case of report of immaturia in this area. So we are now, we organize uh, treatment in the community. 
so not in school but in the community because of the COVID. So these are the alternative strategy to find a way to deworm in the community uh, so that uh, we can uh, uh, reach our target. Brilliant. And what about um, pregnant women, Professor? Amaya Bustindui, who's at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and is also saying thank you very much for a great presentation, amazing achievements. Um, Amaya was asking, can I ask you about your experience with pregnant women in the field? So, so far, uh, when we have the, Nash, the MassDoc administration, uh, it is uh, generally recommend not to give drugs to pregnant women at this occasion, but they can be treated if they want at the health facilities. So, uh, but generally, when it's a mass distribution, uh, we don't provide treatment for especially plastic clientele to pregnant women, but we refer them to the health facility where can, they can be treated at the individual case. But I don't have uh, the report of any of the severe event, etc., occurring in pregnant women that were treated in the health facilities. So this means that uh, also WHO and uh, also some of the publication report that uh, treating pregnant women at some stage can be safe, but it's not recommend to provide at the master administration where there is no uh, careful surveillance. Yeah. And um, uh, about the MDA, uh, Dr. Obiageli Nebe is asking, uh, Professor, you mentioned that Cameroon treats twice in high transmission areas. This strategy is um, approved by the WHO, question mark. Do you have any difficulties in accessing praziquantel tablets as I'm not aware that WHO would approve praziquantel tablets for twice annual treatment? That's a question from uh, Dr. Nebe, who's also saying, congratulations, Professor, this was a brilliant presentation very insightful and a lot of efforts. Okay, thank Dr. Nebe for this question. So for the twice a year treatment, now we, we have this uh, strategy in the few health district and the drugs that we use are part of uh, the overall drug donate we receive in the country. So we include this uh, in our drug application and uh, this is clearly justified because uh, when we justify the reason of using this drug in our application, so we can obtain this from drug, from drug request. So there is no issue for this. Um, let's talk about funding, Professor, uh, for a few minutes. Um, we've got a question here from uh, two questions from John Gibb and also Professor Russell Stottard, who are both uh, thinking about funding. Uh, John Gibb is asking, has the government of Cameroon increased its funding for the program since USAID's withdrawal? And Professor Russell Stottard was asking, do you think USAID will eventually return to funding Shisto and STH control? And if not, what would be a good way to change their minds? Uh, very interesting question. Regarding the government funding, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there was a discussion about funding at the high level steering committee uh, now we are incre including uh, more funding from the government in the financial budget and the budget from the government but there are some increase and also but not significant as you want but we are still continue advocacy so that we have a more significant increase of funding and we hope that in the next future when we have a good decentralization of the activities then from the council, etc., we can have more funding to do it. Uh, regarding USID, uh, we hope that uh, in the future, uh, there will be some convinced evidence for USID to back to the support for the country, because when you move to elimination, we need more resources. And then to convince them, I think that uh, we only have to provide good results and good evidence to convince them that uh, it's good to be on board to support this initiative so that uh, we can all reach, we can together reach uh, the target. Uh, elimination is the huge challenge and require more partner, more funding, etc. But partner also need to be convinced by good evidence from the field and good achievement. The progress report is one of the contribution the development of the roadmap with the clear action, also another point, and then we will see what comes next. 
absolutely. Um, and talking a little bit about um, cross-sector collaboration, we, we had a, a couple questions that were looking at um, sort of what you mentioned in your last slide, the development of infrastructure. Uh, we have a question here from Gilbert Bayenda with the Ministry of Health Uganda. And uh, I should, hello Gilbert. Gilbert uh, gave a webinar, was part of an ICENTD Connect uh, just very recently. So um, uh, lovely to have you back. And if you did miss that, please uh, don't hesitate to go over to our YouTube channel where we have a recording of this whole session. Um, and the same goes as well earlier on. We had a question from uh, Juliet Chami. So uh, Juliet was in conversation with Dan Coley. So um, lovely to see you back at ICENTD Connect. And definitely, please, anyone who missed those, uh, don't hesitate to go back and uh, review those presentations. But back to our question, uh, Gilbert was asking, does Cameroon have major water reservoirs like hydropower dams? And if so, what information is available on their effects on schisto transmission? Uh, and Nkemgo Ngongli was asking, will the construction of TAPS as a preventive tool for COVID-19 reduce the prevalence and reinfection rate of schisto, especially in the far north region of Cameroon? Uh, so the, the second part of the question, I didn't share very well because of the connection. But the first one regarding oh. the, the reservoir, the major electricity reservoir, yes. We have uh, some dams in the, some area, for example, uh, in the north region, uh, Lakdo region, where we have uh, electricity dams, our uh, barrage, and then we also have uh, in the west where we have dam, where we have uh, high transmission. So in some of these, we have a, a high dynamic of transmission. In some of the dam, there is no transmission because of many other factors. But where we have uh, dams with the transmission, the transmission is quite high. Because, so that's why in some of, one of these areas where we have uh, twice a year treatment, is uh, around one of these dams. Brilliant. And then the second question was, I didn't uh, hear the second question very well. because yeah, the, the second question was uh, asking specifically about taps that have been uh, con constructed or introduced as a preventive tool for COVID-19. And so would the presence of those taps reduce the prevalence and reinfection rate of schisto, especially in the far north region of Cameroon? I don't really think so because this is something that points out and the population still have to go to the main river and source of contamination for the other activities. So, uh, but we have to assess because if we don't have a real scientific data on data collection in those area, it's difficult to say by say, but uh, seeing that these are focalized and this body of that was around washing hands but after people have to go to fetch water for other activities. So I don't think that they will re significantly reduce the water contact uh, for all domestic activities, et cetera. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, Professor, we, um, we've, we've just gone a little bit over the time allocated for the webinar. There are still many unanswered questions. So uh, my question to you would be, would we have time for a few more? Um, is that okay with you or do you need to go? No, for me, it's okay. It's okay? So, right. yeah, it's okay, you, yeah. It's proving very popular, as, right? As long as people are still around, it's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. It seems that uh, I keep clearing questions, but the more you answer, the more questions appear. So <laughs> thank you for your time. Okay things that's been highlighted i think a lot of attendees were particularly impressed by the parallel and ongoing efforts in public and particularly media engagement as part of your programs so we have here a question from uh, professor david rollinson from the natural history museum who's asking um who's saying interesting to hear about the training of the journalists do they continue to report on progress and do people living in endemic areas better understand how to avoid an infection? And Justin Nono was also asking, with the current global health crisis and the infodemic linked to it, how do you plan to tackle misinformation in communities and facilitate ownership of the program by these communities en route to elimination of the disease? 
So regarding the question about the journalist, uh, normally the journalists, uh, they work on events. So when there is an event, they cover it and they publish, they write. So when we have uh, the launch of, when you have the, the warming campaign going on, so they report on it, they produce, and then they use the knowledge for the training. But between the two, sometimes it's difficult because uh, there is, we don't have many, many reports on the disease because there is, if there is no event. But that is one of the aspects that we want to move to our elimination. It's good that we have a regular uh, communication around the disease so that we have a more ap good appropriate shown by the, camp, the community, etc. And the uh, misinformation uh, also is also through the communication. Uh, we also have to develop tool and also the skill of journalists, communicators, uh, community leaders, uh, also the population for this to avoid all the this uh, miscommunication uh, that can be detrimental for the program. So this that is also another major, uh, big challenge. Oh, absolutely. Um... Professor, about uh, hybridization of schistosomes, uh, Auris Sodier is asking, how much species hybridization, if any, do you see in Cameroon? A uh, similar question from Simbarashi Gombeza, who's asking, how frequent are incidences of hybrid schistosome infections and how have they affected schistosomiasis control? Uh, regarding hybridization, uh, we have three species of uh, human schistosomiasis in Cameroon. This is Mansona, Hematobium, and Guineensis. Uh, we have several co- and mixed infection uh, for Hematobium and uh, Mansona. But the, between the two, even when you have a sexual interaction between the two species, there is no abolition between the two because they belong to different groups. So uh, the way that we have uh, in the past, there were several uh, abbreviation report between uh, hematobium and guineensis. That was before this, was, this species was called in Cameroon intercalatum. So there were several abbreviation report, et cetera. But the report, uh, the recent study showed that based on this abbreviation, there is some evolution. That is why, for example, in some setting where previously we have uh, intercalatum, uh, when we have the introduction of uh, uh, hematobium, there was some abbreviation and intergressive reduction of uh, intercalatum. And uh, intercalatum disappeared in, in this area, and currently we only have hematobium. So, there, so in this case, there is no further abbreviation anymore because the other species was completely replaced by the second one. So this abbreviation impact is one of the reasons why uh, inter uh, Guinness is only uh, very limited, has very limited distribution, uh, is found only in few areas. Uh, in the area where we have Guinness, there is no Mansonai and there is no Hematobium. So over time, the competition and also the abbreviation lead to the disparation of uh, Guinness. Brilliant. Uh, professor, question from Stephen Bremer. Do you have any collaborative interaction with neighboring countries? And another question by Russell Stottard on this topic. Uh, could you advise on the importance of cross-country coordination, for example, being able to stop cross-border transmission? Uh, in terms of uh, NTD as the general, there is some uh, collaboration between neighboring country, uh, Cameroon, Nigeria, Chad, etc. Uh, for all, but for Shisto itself, uh, apart from some of the collaboration we have in the research project, uh, in the future, it's very good to also develop this uh, South-South collaboration. Uh, for example, in the Kandam project, we have some collaboration with Nigeria with a neighbor country, uh, but this is in the operational research, et cetera. But it's very good at the control level also to synergize and to see what we can do together uh, for this. And that is uh, one of the aspects. So we are, this is under development, and then we'll see how we can strengthen this aspect. Fantastic. Um, and now thinking on a 
local, then regional, then global scale. Um, Catherine Brown's asking a, a very interesting question, given the obvious link between schistosomiasis and water and climate, do you think that potential climate change events, such as adverse weather, flooding, and warming, may alter the spread or emergence of this disease into endemic and non-endemic areas of Cameroon? Yes, uh, climate change also may impact the transmission of the disease. Uh, for example, climate change may impact the distribution of the snail. Uh, now, when you compare the situation of the snail distribution to what was done in the 80s, in some area, we are very surprised that uh, we don't have, we don't find the same snail species where they were found before and we have new one coming. Uh, for example, in Cameroon recently, we described the plant in, in Doplanobis that occur in Cameroon. So with the change of the snail and uh, also the environment, they might also have a change of the disease transmission because they might be, if the snail disappear, then the transmission might be reduced if the snail appear, you might have the spread of the disease. So this impact, uh, we cannot uh, neglect this impact as, as it affects the uh, environment, uh, also the snail and also uh, the transmission setting. Yeah. Great. And uh, for anyone who would like to know more about that specific topic, uh, we also had as part of the GSA series, the pleasure to welcome Dr. Mark Booth from Newcastle University, who was uh, giving a presentation specifically about the uh, impact of climate change. Uh, will this uh, help or will this hinder um, NTD control with a focus on schisto? So again, uh, please don't hesitate to jump over to our YouTube channel if you would like to um, revisit that presentation. Anouk has very kindly put the link to the YouTube channel in the chat as well as many other links, um, including a site savers blog about WASH and NTD data in Kenya, and also a download to the report, uh, Professor Trenchente, that you introduced earlier on. So lots of resources there on, on the chat. Um, we've got a few more questions, uh, Professor, for you. Uh, interestingly here, another question from Kemgo Francis Nongli, who's um, asking, please, does the control program take into account male and female schistosomiasis infection co-infected with HIV during praziquantel deworming? So are you, you've mentioned strengthening health systems, having a very uh, holistic approach as part of the program. So is this something you take into account? Uh the, the difference between the male and female? Or... I think what uh, Francis means is uh, when does the control program take into account anyone, uh, any person, male or female, who is co-infected with schistosomiasis as well as HIV? Is that something you're looking for when you do the uh, prasequential or deworming programs? Uh, at the national level, when we conduct the only program, uh, we don't, there is no difference in terms of treatment between area where you have uh, hematobium, uh, mansonai, etc., and also the infection between the population, because normally both male and female are infected with the schisto. But now we are putting a lot, another aspect, that is a project that we are starting in Cameroon, is about female genital schistosomiasis. And uh, then we'll have more emphasis on this because this will have uh, other implications and other uh, diseases like uh, HIV, etc. Uh, also, the burden of uh, these female genital diseases is not well known in the country. So this is a new project uh, from the core NTD that uh, we have started and then we will implement. And then we hope that with this, we have a better platform to have more resource and project on the female genital schistosomiasis, and then in the future, this will also include male, genit male genital schistosomiasis. So this aspect, but currently for the deworming activity, the warming program itself, there is no difference between or uh, specific act intervention for male or female. Brilliant, thank you. And um, 
It starts with the snail. Perhaps we could finish with the snails. Uh, just a couple questions here, um, back to uh, particularly the uh, snail host and snail mapping. So Hermine Jatsa was asking, um, since 1985, there is not a snail mapping in Cameroon. When uh, would you expect the next snail mapping to be conducted? Uh, currently, the snail mapping, uh, we have some snail survey in terms of uh, the research and also with uh, some students, etc. Uh, but at the snail survey itself nationwide, this is uh, one of the aspects that uh, is highlighted in the roadmap because uh, the snail control and snail distribution uh, should, we should have a clear uh, picture of the snail distribution in the country. So this is the huge task and then we are working on it, but at the survey, at the national level, uh, since the survey conducted in the 80s, there is no further national survey on snail, but that is something that uh, we are working on it so that we can resume it. So we are building capacity on this. Excellent. And um, <clears throat> yeah, you left us with the, the, the slide and, and the clear message that we need now to develop uh, infrastructure and invest in infrastructure. So just to round off this webinar, Professor, uh, what would be sort of quite high up on your wish list, where would you, what would you like to see, whether it be any innovations or increase in funding or partnerships, what would be your ideal next steps, uh, specifically for Cameroon, but perhaps also worldwide in terms of schisto control? So in terms of uh, schisto control, uh, I think that moving toward elimination is a big challenge and a significant paradigm shift. So that had a lot of involvement. And then to succeed in this process, uh, we need to have clear, identify clear intervention that should be done for this. There is a need to have uh, a strong, a very strong commitment from the government and also from the different communities at all levels. Because if we don't invest at this level, the change will not be sustained. Uh, then when you have this, we need also to have a very strong support from the different partner. Uh, support at several levels. The first level also is the support for the initiative. Because when we talk about elimination in the, of Shisto, is not that easy to accept it for the beginning because it's a huge challenge. So uh, for this challenge, they need to have this uh, support of the idea or the initiative and also the support in terms of funding and also in collaboration, in partnership, etc. So that based on this together, we can move together towards this uh, objective and target. Right. Well, I think you've uh, inspired an already very committed audience to uh, continue and um, strengthen uh, these objectives and really invest in <clears throat> the, the, the guidelines you have given us. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Trem Twenty, for your time, uh, mm -hmm. for this uh, incredible overview, these tremendous achievements. I think the audience is uh, really full of enthusiasm for everything that you've done. Um, we've got Kenton Kramer uh, saying aloha from Hawaii. Thank you and excellent presentations. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor from Professor Aftabuddin from Bangladesh, an excellent presentation, a lot of lessons learned. Uh, that certainly summarizes how we all feel, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, so from all of us, a massive thank you, Professor. A huge thank you as well for the audience uh, tuning in. And uh, we are going to take a break next week uh, with the NNN conference, uh, with the um, Shisto specific session as well. We'll be running on next week. So I'm sure we'll have plenty of food for thought there. So we will take a break for a week. And following that, we're back for the rest of September 
uh, looking at trachoma, Chagas disease. Uh, we're also planning our second uh, Cafe Connect, where it's over uh, to the audience. The audience comes on screen and says hello and tells us a little bit more about their own work in their own words. And on September 28th, we'll be celebrating World Rabies Day as well. So plenty to look forward to. Uh, but until we see you again, I wish you all to keep very safe. Lots of children have gone back to school this week, I think. So um, congratulations on that. And just hoping that things are slowly falling a little bit back uh, to what we might call normal. Um, so to everybody, a huge thank you. Keep safe. Keep well. Um, Professor, again, very big thank you. Warm regards from London. And uh, let's definitely keep in touch. If anyone has any more questions for Professor, please don't hesitate to forward them to us or perhaps to contact Professor directly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure the conversation will continue. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the participants to this webinar. It's a very real pleasure to contribute. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. And thanks to the GSA team as well. And uh, hope to see you all very, very soon. All the best. Thank you. Take care. Okay, bye. bye. Okay, bye.